says it. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Welcome to the uh, Charleston Daily Mail editorial board. Uh, it's great to have you both. Um, we're here with uh, David McKinley, Congressman for the Northern District of West Virginia, and Glenn Gaynor, who is currently uh, West Virginia's assessor from the Auditor. Auditor, 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 Auditor yeah, I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, that's the first catch of uh, hopefully very few mistakes on our part. Uh, it's great to have you here, and welcome. Thank you for your time. Uh, we're the Charleston Daily Mail editorial board. And We'll introduce ourselves starting down here. I'm Don Silver, editorial writer. And I'm Kelly Merritt, editorial page editor, and thank you all for being here. I'm Jared Hunt, business editor slash interim state desk guy. Jared is providing coverage. I'm Brad McElhenney, I'm the editor and publisher. And I'm Bill Caraba, I'm the managing editor. Uh, we'll start with you, Mr. Gaynor, okay. just tell us about yourself. Okay. Uh, as you know, I am Glenn Gaynor, and I have served uh, now 22 years as West Virginia State Auditor. I am from Parkersburg, um, and I always tell folks that, you know, I do have a residency here. There's a little codicil in the, con in the Constitution that requires elected officials to have a residency here in the county, so I do have a residency here. But my main home is in Parkersburg, where I raise my family and go to church and, uh, as I say, pay my taxes. Um, but I'm running for Congress. Um, because I really believe that what's going on in Washington right now and um, with the gridlock and, and with the dysfunction, um, I think uh, we need uh, folks that um, are going to be more willing to work bipartisanly across the aisle and try to get things done. Um, uh, you know, I got in this race um, primarily after the government was shut down and we had government shut down for a couple of weeks and uh, we seemed to stumble and struggle to get government working again. And that kind of, as far as I was concerned, uh, was just over the top. Um, I think we deserve better than that, um, not only as people here in West Virginia, the first congressional district, but I think we as Americans. And I got in this race because I just think it's time that we have a new leadership and a new direction in West Virginia. Mr. McKinney. Yeah, and thanks, Brad. And thank you for the chance to just sit down and chat with you for a little bit uh, on this. Um, I, I've um, I've been aware for some time, uh, even into Congress in 2010, um, was the direction the country was going in was a concern, and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> especially now it's been reinforced with some polling that's that's come out. Uh, the uh, NBC and Wall Street Journal both came out with a or they, a combined poll and they talked about that 72 percent of the people think the country's going in the wrong direction, and 60% think our best days are behind us. And, and that is a, as a businessman for well, next year, it'll be 50 years in business. That's not the message that I, I wanted to see Washington or come out of where we're going. I want to get that American dream back again. Uh, so I think one thing what want you to do is, if, from the, my business background, was let's go back and go into the details. What, what happened? Why has... Why have people given up? Why is this American dream? Why are people, young people, thinking that they don't, their, their lives are not gonna be better? And let's go back and try to focus on that. And one of the things that I think that primarily what we, we've been focused, trying to do, and that was uh, do what you say you're gonna do. What a novel idea in Washington uh, for, and, and for political figures anywhere is to do what they say they're gonna do. And so that's what we've been doing for the last three and a half years is we set out a goal, we put five things out there, we'll hopefully we can talk about that in a few minutes. But of those five things, we've actually we've worked on all five of them to actually fulfill what people were expecting. So we're, we're doing what we said we're gonna do. And, and if, it's, if it turns this country around in a way, if it's one person at a time or one congressman at a time, but I wanna reinstill the confidence in the political system in Washington because it's the best government we've got to work with. So as a result, that, I'm, I'm trying to bring 50 years of business, someone that, that's uh, taken a risk in business to try to make something happen and try to use that in the experience that I've gained in, in uh, the private sector. And I think it's been very beneficial so far in Washington. And uh, uh, the auditor's right, uh, is that we have to work bipartisan. And that was one of the first things that, that we've done since day one. Is, as I legislature in West Virginia back 30 years ago, with being in the minority, You've got to work together, and that's what we've been doing. Everything, virtually every bill, every amendment I put in has been bipartisan. And I think as a result, it's, it's paying off. 
Uh, we passed seven bills, and we've uh, had, had 31 amendments go over to the Senate. So things are moving in the right direction because we're working the right thing. We're doing what we said we're going to do. So look forward to your questions. Oh, uh, first of all, this is a great race. We have an accountant, we have an engineer. I think this is this is just great, not two lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> And the biggest issue right now in America is Obamacare. It is the least popular domestic program since Prohibition. And unlike Prohibition, it didn't pass with bipartisan support for 46 of the 48 states. You seem stuck with it at least for the next two years. What's the first thing you would change if you could change it? And we'll start with you, Mr. Gaynor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of things that we need to do, um, and probably one of my biggest criticisms um, during this campaign has been around the Affordable Care Act from the standpoint that, you know, it became law over four years ago, and Congress has taken 40 or 54 votes to repeal it, and, um, you know, it's disappointing that we didn't spend the last four years working on solutions and trying to correct some of the problems uh, with it. When you look at what's happening here thousand people um, that have taken advantage of that, 20,000 on the private side and 150 in the expansion of, uh, of Medicaid here in West Virginia. And as we get into this election cycle, everybody's for the pre-existing condition, doing away with that. Everybody's for eliminating the lifetime cap on an illness. Everyone's for keeping your kids on uh, their insurance until the 26. But yet we voted 54 times to take those things away, including black lung benefits. To work on that, and some of the things that I think we need to do. One, we have to improve competition. West Virginia, we've only got one, you know, one player in the exchange, and that's Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, you know, in order for it to be more successful, and the whole the, the concept of it was to bring about more competition within the private sector, and we don't have that in West Virginia. We have one participant in that. Some of the other things I think we have to look at is is um, doing away with the state boundary lines and allowing insurance coverage and insurance carriers to cross the line. West Virginia is a border state. We've got the, you know we have five states bordering us. That would really help our competition and, and I believe help us uh, in a way of improving the Affordable Care Act by creating more competition by allowing and going away with the uh, artificially imposed border restrictions. Same is true with with healthcare and being able to access healthcare providers across the border. I'm from Parkersburg. And within my insurance plan, um, I'm limited to, to, a hot, to the single hospital there in Parkersburg, can go across the border to Marietta Memorial if I would choose, and I'm limited to using doctors that are on the West Virginia side of the border. We need to, you know, those types of things need to be changed in order not only to improve, but I think improve the act. And uh, I think what we really need to have been, done, uh, been doing over the last four years is working on that. Same way with the uh, Cadillac plan and the penalty on the Cadillac plan. Once again, I, I don't understand why when they passed that act, they put a penalty in there for employers that were wanting to offer insurance that was better than the baseline within the plan. So uh, those are some of the areas. I think, I think the, the, border, uh, the border restriction is probably one of the first things I think we need to do, and I think we also have to address uh, the issue with the Cadillac plans and, and, and the penalty there. Well, first, <clears throat> Let's make sure we clarify one issue. Uh, yeah, I think we voted 50 times uh, in one way or another, but only three times to repeal it. And, and that <clears throat> the rest haven't been amendments. And many of the amendments are what the auditor talked about, uh, that we need to make those changes because we know it's the law of the land. But there were had, the three votes were to repeal and replace it. But you go into what are the changes, and that's unfortunate. Many of the changes, uh, 17 of the, there was a nice article in USA Today, and it talked about 17 of them of those 40 some votes that we cast were passed by the house passed by the senate and signed by the president that actually have gone into law they try to make the affordable care act the obama care is no it make it work but it's still other problems with it and, and we know that so that's what a lot of these amendments what we're trying to do right now are make it work uh, just make it work things that he's already mentioned the cadillac thing there uh, the medical device tax. Why are we penalizing people that need prosthetics, uh, wheelchairs, and the like? Why are we why are we taxing? We shouldn't be doing that. Uh, why are we taxing contractor uh, the the construction uh, uh, workers uh, for what we, what they were only referred to in Washington is called a, a belly button tax? <laughs> I wish they could work with a better name for it, but it's a sixty five dollar per person per family. Uh, so you got a, a family of five paying sixty. They're they're going to pay. $325 more on their health insurance because they've negotiated a good contract. That's not right. Same thing with cattle. 
But what we're doing is trying to strike down some of the provisions we know are holding back the economy. You can't, you can't build an, an economic base when you reduce the hours down to 30 hours. So these are some of the amendments that, that he's referred to is that we passed out of the House. Some have gone on to the president for signature, but others are still being hung up over there because we're concerned about making the system work. I don't like it. I'd rather replace it with some other policy, another program, one with using health savings account, better tort reform, they crossing state lines, uh, developing high risk pools, all the things that we know could work. We don't want to go back to the old way because that, that's why they had to pass this thing in the first place because it was a broken health care system. And so now we, we've got in place, we got some things, now let's work it and see if we can make it work. First Congressional District, northern part of the state, is a big booming energy area. And um, you know, are we, are we are, are, you know, policies set by the federal government that Congress can control, are they helping that grow? Or are they restricting that? And you know, what policies are there that, that may be good? And, and what can be done to make, make a, or the economy there, the energy economy better? Well, if you want me to start on that, yeah. uh, that's, a, that's a, the, the two primary energy sources in the northern part of the state, coal and, and natural gas. Uh, let's take coal first. Um, uh, coal is, is the backbone of our economy in West Virginia. And, and uh, for us to try, uh, from, for the administration, Obama, and the, and the EPA to try to uh, cut it down, we're currently around the country producing about 40% of the energy in America that comes from coal. Um, and what we can't get them to pin down is where they really want it to go, to 15%, to 20%, where is that, where they want it to go, and they, they won't address that. Um, and that causes uncertainty. So what we're trying to do right now is hold on to our basic industries, uh, energy sources, that's that base load that's created in our powerhouses coming from coal. We know it's the most affordable, dependable economic energy source, but the EPA is indeed, there's a war on coal. And we see that with when they, they try to export coal. And there's I know of one example out in Bellingham, Washington. I went out there, I met the mayor out there, and they, they've been trying for five years to be able to export West Virginia coal. Can't get the permit because of this administration. Mm -hmm. So we know this pressure. They're trying to put re regulations on. I love it as an engineer. Uh, and there are only two of us in Washington that are engineers, by the way. So there are 242 attorneys. Now I make sure, it, not that there's anything wrong with that, as <laughs> Seinfeld said. But I, I like the mix because we have a very pragmatic approach towards things. We understand that coming from the business sector, what we have to do. But what they're trying to do is, is push back against it, try to push something that that's, uh, the CO2 emissions are contributing to the climate change. I'll be the first to say there's climate change going on. But let's not take a simplistic route and say it's all about coal or natural gas. Now let's now touch on gas now. A good <coughs> example of what's happening there, uh, I think all the fracking, it just so far, not all wood has been safe. We asked Lisa Jackson when she was head of the EPA, for, for the record, has anyone lost their water wells or anything happened with that? And she has. She said across the country, not yet. Could that happen? Yes. But right now, that's a lot of scare tactics people are using to try to discourage us from using natural gas. Now, where's the future with that? Two things. One is having a, a great petrochemical facility in Wood County with with Braskem and Odebrecht but to locate the facility there because that's going to be a, a true game changer in the High Valley, not only with the jobs that are created there and the gas that comes there, but the secondary downstream industries, the people that are going to be able to use the, the resins from that product to have a whole group. You've seen it here in, in the kind of chemicals, but that's what's going to happen with the gas industry in, in the Wood County area. But we also have to be able to allow liquefied natural gas to be exported to Europe because in so doing, we'll develop a, a complete network of piping systems throughout West Virginia that we don't have right now, and we'll have a market for our gas in, in Europe and elsewhere with that. So the idea of being able to go uh, to export our LNG is very important, and, and once again, the administration the EPA are holding up the permits. We know of six permits that are out there, and they've, they've granted one of six in six years. This isn't good for our economy. It's no wonder we still have 20 million people underemployed or unemployed in West Virginia around this country. We've got to pay a lot more attention to it. Thank you.
for energy. Yeah, I, I, um, I agree with David. When you look at uh, the first congressional district, coal, and we have coal and electric as well as natural gas. And when we look at what, what's happening in coal, and, and a lot of times when we talk about the coal issue, the coal-fired power plants in the first congressional district. And West Virginia has been a huge exporter of electricity down to the northeast. Um, and even down into Virginia, uh, of course, outside of John Amos here. But you know, we've got a lot of power plants, be it Mount Storm all the way to all the plants that run up and down the Ohio River. So, you know, I'm very sensitive to um, the tax base that the uh, electric industry provides to West Virginia. It's critical. And, and from a job perspective to those folks living and working in the 1st Congressional District, um, when we look at uh, what's happening and, and what the EPA is doing with their, uh, you know, uh, with the restrictions, it's almost as if the EPA is single coal out and say you're going to be a loser. Um, you know, not discount or discounting the fact that seven billion human beings on the face of this earth have a tremendous impact on CO2 emissions in this country. But the coal industry and, and particularly the use of that for generation of en uh, energy is being singled out. Um, I, you know, I think it's a, a, a very noble cost to try to reduce CO2 emissions. We all understand CO2 and the and the impact it's having uh, on the environment and what's happening the impact happening on the uh, you know on this on this globe so we have to work with that but we need to push that out in, in order to give technology time to catch up and allow technology I'm also um, uh, disappointed that the Department of Energy is still sitting on eight billion dollars in loans they should be making uh, to the industry sector in order to help them uh, with the carbon uh, carbon capture um, you know once again I think the EPA is just letting us down on all fronts uh, when it relates to coal when we look at natural gas uh, natural gas is a huge boom and uh, we do need to make sure that we're getting the permits in place um, in order to, to develop the pipeline. We need to put the pipeline between West Virginia over to Baltimore where they're um, preparing to build a, a LNG plant. Uh, absolutely, that's critical to us. The, the pipeline that we need to build um, from uh, uh, Clarksburg uh, down to Duke Energy um, is, once again, that, that's something that's, that's critical to the state of West Virginia and to that industry. So we need to be working and making sure that where the permits are being put in place in order to help both those industries um, and that, that we also push the CO2 standards um, and down the road a little bit so that we do not unfairly um, impact that. Because all that's going to do is take away from competition. I think, I think it's good that we have competition coming from natural gas. It's going to be good for the consumers. It's, hopefully it will lower energy prices for all of us. But we need to make sure that we have competition, we have true competition, and that the federal government's not uh, arbitrarily picking winners and losers as they appear to be doing right now. Let me build off that just for a minute on uh, one other element, Dick, is this, on the, my committee assignment in Washington is energy and commerce, so I get embroiled a lot in this whole discussion about energy, and I love it because we haven't had anyone on that committee from West Virginia, think about that, in 50 or 60 really? years. It was just, it was an oversight that we didn't have. So I negotiated to get on that committee, and I've become a very outspoken advocate of, of our fossil fuels in, around this country. But let's put, it, put things for your viewers and audience or, and your readers in, into consideration. If we were to stop all fossil fuel, all coal production, use, burning, coal everywhere in America, every coal-fired powerhouse, every factory, every institution, facility, just no coal burn whatsoever. Forget about what that does to the employment, but just if we were to not burn any coal whatsoever, we would reduce the CO2 emissions of the globe by two tenths of one percent. So that's where I'm challenging this whole. It's is it worth upsetting our entire economy for two tenths of one percent when at the same time China and India, between the two of them, are have already announced building new coal-fired powerhouses in those two nations that are three times greater than our total capacity now in America. So if we were to go to zero, it's already going to be well made up and, and more so by other nations that are continuing to burn coal. So all we've done is put ourselves at risk. Now, shame on us, and that's why much of what we're trying to do in Washington is find money for research so that we can burn our coal cleanly and crisp in a way that does not harm the economy. And we're making great strides on that. We're already seeing the CO2 emissions uh, in this country are at the lowest they've been in 17 years. I'll go ahead with another. One of two engineers in Congress. I yes. We mentioned what, 262 lawyers, I think you said. 
Um, how many auditors are there in Congress? And, is, and it sounds like there's not enough of them considering yeah, yeah. our deficit. Well, there's one in the Senate, I believe, but that's, uh, that's the only one I'm aware of. Talk to me about, uh, or talk to us about the, you know, the, the federal deficit or, or in just budgeting. <coughs> yeah, you know, and, and that's, you know, that's other, one of the things that I talk a lot about. You know, here in West Virginia, we have to pass a balanced budget. And we, we go back and, and we look at uh, when President Clinton it was the last time we had a balanced budget in this country. And it wasn't easy. And um, we need to get back there. And the trouble is, yes, we have a spending problem in this country. But we also um, had um, President Clinton's uh, budget uh, and, and work that he had done, both the tax rates and uh, spending plan that he had put in place. Had, we, had that still been in place today, we would still have a balanced budget today. But unfortunately, that was, that was undone by the very next administration. So we've got to get back to that. We've got to get serious about that. And it's not easy. Um, but, but, you know, one of the things that, and, and this is another area that I have frustration with, you know, as, as, a, as, you know, as being state auditor, you know, we look at things very much black and white, not a lot of shades of gray in things that we do. It's either right or wrong. And it, it's tough to balance. It's tough to balance the budget. It's not an easy thing to do. But we've got to stop, just like with the Transportation Act, we've got to stop passing these supplemental appropriation bills and extending these acts for four or five, six months down the road and put in a long range plan. Transportation is a, is a perfect example. We need a long term transportation solution in this country, not a six month transport, transportation solution. So, you know, we've got to get back to putting these place, you know, long term planning in place, stop these continuing resolutions on spending um, because it's not doing any of us any good. But it's not easy. Transportation, we've got a funding problem with transportation. It's dependent upon the gasoline tax. And we all know cars are getting higher gas mileage. We have electric cars. Now we have natural gas powered cars. You know, we have hybrids. We have um, biodiesel. You know, we've got all these other, you know, all these other cars on the road. And, and, and our tax structure has not kept pace with that because it's a gasoline tax. Gasoline usage is going down. Guess what? Our tax rate's going down as well. So we don't have the money to, to rebuild the road infrastructure. We've got to start dealing with these issues. And the only way to do that is to, is to pass long range like uh, legislate or long range legislation and, and not the, just to continue stopgap methods. In many respects, he's right. We can't get it out of the Senate. We pass long range bills. Uh, the House has passed eight appropriation bills uh, to give a long term budget, but um, Harry Reid has chosen not to do that uh, over on the Senate side. So that's why you wind up having these continuing resolutions. But listen, it, it comes down to you can't cut prosperity and we can't tax our way back to prosperity. We've got to grow our economy. That's what the, that's going to be the secret to it. Uh, so we look at one of the things that we were trying to do in the, in the um, over on the House. And we again, this was one of those 360 bills that are sitting over on the Senate. It it was bipartisan support, uh, very strong support with it. It was called cut cap and balance. Cut spending, cap the spending. So the long term into the future, we'll be able to understand if we're running right now, we're spending about 25% of the GDP. We got to get it back down to the norm. The average for the last 50, 60 years is around 18%. We've got to have some discipline force upon us to get that to over 18%, get back to that 18% growth rate or the spending rate that you have based on GDP. So as the economy gets off, then there, there's more money to spend. But they, that's so you cut your spending, you cap it at 18%, and then you pass the balanced budget amendment. Because that, it's just like West Virginia. West Virginia, we, we've lived under here. We have a balanced budget. We make it happen. It's a constitutional requirement. No one person is, but it's a constitutional requirement. Why are we doing the same thing at the federal government level? Because, and it can happen. Because we we had four years in a row, we had a balanced budget federally. 99, 2000, and one and two. And unfortunately, after that, we went to war. And people retaliating for this attack on our 9-11, uh, that we went to war against Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and, and from that point, we've not been able to recover on the spending because we were spending, we were at war. Um, it wasn't, I think, the government, the Congress wanted to spend a lot of money, but we as Americans, we had to stand up for what happened. We had a terrorist attack and we had to spend that money. But in many ways, that's why we don't have a, a balanced budget amendment at the federal level for in times of war. We are going to go into deficit spending. It's just a, it's just a matter as far as national defense of why we don't have that. I understand 
what the, what the Congressman was saying there, but, but you know, there's a reason why we don't have that type of amendment at the, at the federal level, but it is up to Congress. And unfortunately, when we went into those two wars, we did not address the cost and the spending of that. And, um, you know, another thing that we've done um, along those lines is, you know, we've gone under this precept, we're going to cut taxes, and that's going to help generate jobs. And we've, and we've used that philosophy really since Ronald Reagan was president, other than during the eight years that Bill Clinton was president. And that happened to be when we had the four years of a balanced budget was under Bill Clinton. And he did not prescribe to that as much because if cutting taxes automatically leads to job growth, we should have all the jobs, that we should have more jobs than we have people to fulfill them. That type of philosophy has not worked. And that's the difference. Let me, uh, let me add a history lesson uh, for the auditor that uh, actually the, the first one of the most notable tax cuts took place under John F. Kennedy. Jack, Jack Kennedy did that and showed that that works and it's worked every time since that time, but we're at war. But there are other things that, that you know, getting this balanced budget, because I, I agree, we've got to get to a balanced budget. We know we can do it. Um, but th things like what, what, what bothers me as a businessman over there is the size of government and how they spend. Uh, there's so much waste, fraud, and abuse. If it were easy to fix, maybe they'd have it fixed by now. But I think you have to have determination to stay on course that we're going to go after that, that waste, fraud, and abuse. We have from the GAO, the Government Accounting Office, that they're saying in Medicare, because of the sheer size of the spending in Medicare, that they're thinking anywhere from 150 to 200 billion with a B is wasted every year. Just imagine if we could capture that. We're $680 billion short of balancing our budget this year, or for this, this deficit that we're running this year. There could be a third of it. There are, there, are other, there are a host of other plans. One, as I said, was that cut cap and balance plan. Uh, it, we're moving in the right direction. Think about it. This is the first time in three years, this is the first in three years, the federal spending has actually decreased. And we Republicans in the car, we're the minority party. We, don't, we barely control the House, we don't have the Senate, we don't have the presidency, but we were loud and obnoxious enough, apparently, that got the attention of the other bodies, and they go, we bent the curve. We're actually spending less than the year before. That's progress, and it shows when we need to get together, we'll get together, and we're moving in that direction. You all alluded to it earlier, uh, Congress is the body that declares war. Traditionally, that's been against other countries, but there's something going on with uh, these guys who want to call themselves the Islamic State. Uh, there's not been a congressional vote on that at this point. Should there have been, and what should America's first be? A absolutely, and there should be a vote on that. Um, I don't like the fact that the, uh, the this administration is trying to use back the uh, authority that was given to the president to fight terrorism after in the 2002 after the uh, attack on the towers and in, in Washington. Uh, that was given authorization to fight, and, and he's going back and saying, this is another fact of a war on terrorism, so I'm gonna use that. We're not, we haven't been back in session now to a point, we're, when we go back in, we wanna talk about that. We need, we believe there needs to be another reauthorization of that, uh, because uh, I wanna make sure that we're doing it for the right reason. Uh, I'm not, and I'm not convinced yet that this is an American role. We can, we can be, we've already done one as we authorize the training um, for the moderate uh, Syrian rebels. We've used it for training for the Kurds and all, but all the money in terms of looking at for balance, but all the money is coming from Saudi Arabia. So all we're doing is providing the, the wherewithal, the know-how and, and know-how, but the money for the, and the weaponry is all coming from Saudi Arabia. More intense with that because that just flying airstrikes in there is one thing, but there has to be an authorization for us to be there for long term. And I'm not convinced yet that this is our role. This is a role, I think, for the global community and it's one that should not be Christians versus Muslims. And I think that's been very important. I applaud the president in pulling together a coalition of Muslim nations to, to go about to do this, because it has to be Muslim versus Muslim not Christians, or so we don't need another uh, opportunity for them to call this a crusade and rally people against all Christians around the world. 
So we're gonna, it's going to be an interesting discussion, but I think it's time we have an adult conversation about this in Washington. Yeah, I would agree with uh, with the congressman. I mean, it, it, there needs to be congressional oversight and approval for that. Um, you know, and now I'm not um, as uh, and, and would have voted against arming the the, the rebels. Um, you know, that's not worked out so well for this country. Um, last time we did that was in Afghanistan. It turned out the Taliban, um, and that that really history has not ever um, proven that to, to be so well for us. But you know, uh, the congressman did. Um, bring up another point about when Congress gets back into session, and that's part of my frustration, more so as a taxpayer. Um, since August, Congress has been in session two weeks. By the time they go back to work in November, it'll have been 12 weeks that uh, they've only worked two out of the last uh, 14 weeks. Um, I think when you have issues like this going on, Congress needs to be doing the job, and they need to be meeting, and they need to be addressing these things. You know, delaying and not doing this and then waiting until after the election to, to make some of these issues, some of these decisions, I don't believe is in the best interest um, of this country. If we are truly at war, and we are, I think we should be, we should be addressing those things, not waiting until uh, we get off vacation again to go back and address these issues. Well, uh, can't let that go untouched. Uh, the, uh, I mean, cer certainly we're not on vacation, and, and you know better than that. Uh, but it, in terms of uh, the issue we got into in Washington, uh, it was, was clever. I thought uh, uh, Harry Reid sent a message over to uh, uh, John Boehner on Tuesday night and said, I'm adjourning. I don't care what you all have planned for September and October. He said, "My the Senate is not coming back in until November the 12th. So Boehner called it. We had a caucus and to sit down and talk about it. What are we going to do? We could, we could be for optics. It might be good to look like we're, we were there. But anything we pass, is good. there's no one in the Senate to receive it. So it's a real interesting dynamics over there, how the system works, uh, and the frustration many of us have because when you're dealing with 435 in the House and 100 in the Senate, and the Senate's up for uh, uh, a marginal elections this time to find out whether Harry controls the Senate or not, there's a, there, Harry's afraid, uh, the Senator's afraid to cast some votes. So he adjourned the Senate. Now I'm on a letter asking Boehner uh, to call us back in or call uh, to work with uh, Harry, uh, Harry Reid to call us back in session for a special time like this. I, it probably go nowhere because I, the Senator Nevada doesn't seem to be too interested. He's more interested in putting his can his races ahead uh, of where I think the country's going. And, and that's, I think, part of what feeds into the American public. When the American public wants to see something done and you're seeing someone over on the Senate side play politics, we don't have time for it. This is America. American dreams right on the edge. Let's focus on that. Isn't that the, supposed to be the world's greatest deliberative body? Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's just an excuse not to vote. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of politics being played on both sides. Uh, uh, my next? Okay. <clears throat> the good news is Congress is more popular than Ebola. <laughs> the bad news is yeah. not by much. As you go out in your campaign, you meet with people, so maybe you have an idea. Uh, you should have an idea. How do you how do you regain the public's trust as a congressman? Well, you know, I think it, it, it comes down to and, and 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 David talks a lot about the legislation that the House has passed and the Senate that's gone nowhere in the Senate. And this gets back to my you know to my last uh, comment about how much. Congress has been in session, and it is a fact. Senate is only meeting 60% of the time that they did just four years ago. That's a fact. It is what it is. And you can say what you want to say about, well, it's a Senate or it's the House. At the end of the day, congressmen and senators are not spending enough time in Washington doing their job. And it goes beyond it, just meeting. But it goes as, as far as getting to know each other as human beings and working together so that you can work these compromises. You can pass a bill all day long out of the House of Representatives, but if you're not there to work it and work through the Senate and work that legislation through the Senate, it's going to no go nowhere. I mean, it, yeah, it makes you feel good. You can pound your chest and say, oh, we passed all these bills and it, it, the Senate's done nothing. But when you're passing the legislation that has no chance of getting through the Senate, then you've wasted your time. You need to be working on these things. The only way you can do that, I've been in the legislative process 22 years in Charleston, the only way you can get there is working together on both sides so that when legislation is running, 
both sides are, have come to a, a, at least somewhat of an agreement where that legislation is going to go. But unfortunately, what we're seeing in Washington is a House that's taking extreme positions on a lot of issues, and sure, it's going nowhere when it gets to the Senate. But that's part of the, the, the balance of power that we have. So we need to be finding areas that we can agree to and working on those. But I think a lot of it comes back to, to being congressmen and senators and spending your time in Washington and working on these solutions and, 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 and even more importantly, getting to know each other and working together. I know Senator Burr, and, and one of the most uh, uh, unique things that, that, that I'll never forget about Senator Burr is when, when he had his 90th birthday party, he talked about his four best friends in the, in the United States Senate, which was uh, Howard Baker, um, uh, um, uh, Senator um, uh, Ted Stevenson from Alaska, two Republicans, Ted Kennedy and Senator Inouye. Those were his four best friends, two Republicans, too. But guess what? He said, oh, we disagree on policy from time to time. But they were best friends. that They could communicate and they could talk. And I don't think we, I don't see that in Washington today because we continue to play politics on every single issue every single day. And I don't think we have to get beyond that. Well, the numbers uh, don't quite stack up what he's referring to, but, uh, uh, but let, let me run a couple of things here. I, uh, we have 61 of those 365 bills are over there. They're sponsored by Democrats, and they still don't bring them up. So I don't think the Democrats are necessarily those 61 think that their bills are extremists. Uh, uh, 220 of them are passed by overwhelmingly bipartisan support. It's, again, it, they said they just a different agenda over on the Senate side. But let's not, let me try to get away from that for just a minute. Just probably, so, yes, we're not in Washington, but what are we doing? We're, we are working among our 20 counties. This year, we will have held over 250 roundtable meetings with constituents in our 20 counties. That's what we do. We're not on vacation. We're out there. We're meeting with people. And almost invariably, Don, something will come up in one of those meetings as a nugget that we take back to Washington and get a bill introduced or an amendment put together with it because we get it from the people. I, I don't have all the answers. I'm a civil engineer from Wheeling, West Virginia. Okay, I'm a small businessman. I've been hired to do this job and I'm doing the best I can, but, but I've learned by listening to what other people are talking about. And when I hear people talk about what we have to do in manufacturing, what we have to do there, what we have to do about healthcare, one of the things too that came out that I, I wasn't aware of for a few months after getting there in 2011, was there one of the biggest fights in Washington, it's not, not what the auditor's talking about, the Democrat Republic, it's a lot of it in Washington is about big cities versus small towns. They don't understand that. We don't have the votes in the small towns. The, the big cities are LA and Chicago, San Francisco, uh, uh, Boston, New York. You, you name, name it. They by far overwhelm the number of votes that we have in rural America. So as a result, they get run, we get run over sometimes. So what we have to do is we have to speak louder. We, we think about things in healthcare that they, they were trying to talk about maybe we'll make some savings in Medicare by reducing funding to critical access hospitals. Well, you can, but of the 60 some hospitals we have in West Virginia, 20 of them are critical access hospitals. You would be decimating healthcare in West Virginia. You talk about, that, that was the same, when we were able to block that. Then they turn around now, they're already, that's the first leg of a four, four step process of cutting out home healthcare in areas. Alaska will be cut 75% of home health care in Alaska will go under. 62% of home health care in Montana will go under. 35% of home health care in West Virginia will go under. They, they just don't grasp the difference between big cities and their issues of infrastructure and like and what you and I deal with in West Virginia. I consider all of West Virginia very rural. Some more rural than others. When you, when you go to Barracksville, when, you know, outside Fairmont, and 75% of the people retired. They, they, they don't even have a truck to be able to take care of some of their needs. It, there's where a lot of the fight is. It's big cities, Republican and Democrat versus rural America. And so what we have to do is speak out loudly. And it, it also permeates over into the energy issues. When was the last, who, who ever saw a coal mine in Boston or in New York or a, or a coal-fired powerhouse in St. Louis? They're not there. They're in, the, they're in the suburbs. That's where the EPA held its hearing, so why not? <laughs> that's right. They wouldn't even come to us to talk to us about it. So you're right. That's what a lot of this is about. 
So this breakdown is a lot be becomes a conflict between how big cities deal with, and talk about the infrastructure, infrastructure in a big city is a lot different than it is because they don't have the critical mass to be able to pay for some of this infrastructure. Whether it's sewer and water line separation, I can go on and on and on with it, but you, that's, that's a lot of what this fight in Washington or, or dysfunction is and relates to big cities versus the rest of us. We're uh, here in the Kano Valley, the, the natural gas in the loan is a little bit out of sight, out of mind, unless you take a drive north. But when you do, you know, you see wells and you see uh, hotels that appear to be booked for oil and gas workers. Um, what do you see in terms of when you're out having meetings or, or driving around the landscape? Do you, do you see signs of increasing prosperity or is it still a struggle for people in the northern district. I think it's still, I think it's still a struggle. Um, you know, uh, you know, hotel industry is doing well. Restaurant industry is doing well. Uh, we still have a lot of folks coming in out of Oklahoma and Texas. I, you know, when I drive around, David, I know about you. I see a lot of Texas and Oklahoma license plates. Um, I've talked to, to many in the industry, and they talk about the knowledge. You know, you know, uh, in West Virginia, we pretty much drill just shallow wells. A little different technology drilling these deep wells and, and the fracking process and um, you know a lot of them in the industry tell me there's a knowledge trans transition going on and a transfer of knowledge uh, and, and training um, West Virginians and our people to, to drill these deep wells um, but we haven't seen that yet you still see a lot of trailer parks it seems like uh, every time I drive uh, down the road I see a new trailer park that's popped up with uh, RVs uh, being parked in a, in a field uh, for these workers so we're not necessarily seeing that, like I said, other than in, the, in those two industries. Um, you know, it's my hope that, that we see that knowledge transfer take place and we, and we talk to more and more West Virginians that now have full-time jobs. Now, those that I have talked to are working long hours, making great wages, um, and so you're starting to, you're beginning to see some of that. Um, but unfortunately, we're not seeing the investment in capital here in West Virginia um, from a lot of these are coming in, they're drilling the wells, um, you know, they're, they're setting up temporary operations and we're not seeing the, the brick and mortar type facilities necessarily coming in all across the district a little bit but not uh, in, in the service sector for the well and gas uh, operations but not necessarily huge investments yet it's a process um, I, um, I think the gas industry is going to take off it, it's going to continue to grow watch and see what happens uh, and I'm, I'm still very confident that Brassman is going to locate in Wood County and, and produce thousands of jobs there um, not only construction jobs but also downstream jobs at different companies are coming. So long term, you just have to be patient with this. Um, but but I'm, I'm concerned because I still see there's there pockets of growth, but then there are there more weakness than anything else. Um, we do a lot of casework. Uh, it's one thing that I don't think most people understand. One of our responsibilities is in Congress is, is uh, to, to receive phone calls from veterans and military folks, uh, uh, families or senior citizens they call washington and washington and social security says call your congressman so we get these calls supposedly as i've seen some rough numbers with it our office handles one of the highest numbers of caseloads in the country i'm really proud of our people we handle over 900 cases this year of people that call in and need some help on veterans issues or or uh, 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 to be able to get health care or their social security, something's happening. But we're hearing the fact that that number is increasing every year. It's either we're doing a better job reaching out to people because we want to represent them in the best way, or the economy is still soft enough that people need that additional assistance from. I'm not sure which of the combination it is, but I'm very proud of our staff. They do a, a magnificent job. We have people that, in, 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 uh, like in Parkersburg, handle nothing but veterans issues be able to take care of our veterans. These people that have put themselves in harm's way and come back and have a problem, I want to make sure they're taken care of. So with this economy growing, it's a, it's a step. What you have to remember is coming from the business side, you either have some short-term goals and some long-term goals. And our long-term goals, we have to be able to start capturing more what happened in the Fairmont area where they where they put in those with the high-tech park up there. That has had a magnificent effect on the economy of North Central West Virginia. Just think if we could capture that and do that elsewhere, 
like over in the, uh, the ballistics plant over in Kaiser, West Virginia, uh, where they have, what in, in Fairmont, you'll have these various anchors, and then you might have five or six companies working with them. Well, let's do the same thing over in the Eastern Panhandle, where we have IBM and ATK, the two major uh, global groups that are working there. If they would start contracting with some of the local people, could give them employment as well. So we've got to capture that model and use that elsewhere. And I think we could do it all over the state of West Virginia, not just in the first district, but I think of where you could see that thing popping back up again. That's why we're hoping with the Brasken facility, that's gonna have that anchor and all the business around it. I think you go down to Beckley and you see what's happened with the, the Bechtel Family uh, Summit Center for the Scouts. I think that has a chance of being a real anchor for development in that area as well. But they've gotta got to be able to embrace having all these satellite subcontractors working for you. And that that's what is country, but what we need in West Virginia, because I think with, with, with shame on our predecessors, they didn't diversify our economy very well. So we're in that process of diversification right now. And just bear with us as we go through short-term goals and long-term goals. Um, just following up a little bit on that question, I had a, a question on earlier, but I think this will still touch back on it. When you're talking about you know, creating these hubs that we can create spokes with, The first two districts will be benefiting from uh, from the Marshallis shale and gas. Mm -hmm. uh, we just had Mr. Jenkins in last week talking about well, talking of Southern West Virginia coal. Uh, how can we work to help our third guy down in the coal fields? <laughs> well, right. I, th I think we mentioned it earlier on, um, and that is when in my meetings with our manufacturers. We tell you the first thing: you got to have an infrastructure. You got to get your product to market. And if we don't have four-lane highways and adequate bridges with weight weight requirements on them, instead of limitations on it to be able to carry 80,000 pound loads on them, um, that's going to be a deterrent. If we don't have good broadband coverage, you imagine today being able to try to function without having good broadband uh, connections. So. First and foremost, in, in Southern West Virginia, I, I would think, well, a, a, in any place in West Virginia, if you're expected to see any kind of growth in any area, make sure they have a good highway system, good railroads and river, uh, uh, to be able to take care of the product and make sure it gets out and make sure they can work on the internet with that. Um, so I, 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 I just know it can happen. But, you know, I've been talking a lot about Wood County. If you haven't been to the manufacturing, Hino's got a, a, a manufacturing facility there. It, it sh should be for every location, but take, take a look at that. This Hino Manufacturing is a truck manufacturing, and they take literally within, they'll take two steel channels off a wall, put them in a jig, and about two and a half hours later, a truck <laughs> drives out the door. That doesn't have to just happen in Wood County. That could happen in Wyoming County or Wayne County or, or Mercer County. It could happen in, in any other location all over West Virginia. We just have to be able to find it convince people to take a risk that West Virginia's got a wonderful workforce and a, a good element. I, 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 get on, I get too much on a, a, a cut overconfident that we can do it. We got to be able to reestablish that confidence in America that are alive. And for Hino to come here and locate here, they have found out how successful it is to locate a plant in West Virginia. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when we look at what's happening, uh, particularly in the first congressional district, and you look at the quarter between Clarksburg and Morgantown, the high tech quarter, you know, and, and, and I'm on record and, and, and I'll continue to say, you know, government can't create jobs, but we can't create the environment in which to create jobs. However, when we look at what ha has happened there, uh, when the coal industry and the high sulfur coal really uh, went out of use, um, you know, we had Congressman Allhan that really stepped in, and there was tremendous, tremendous federal dollar infusion in the first congressional district. When you look at the high tech part, a lot of that was built with federal money, and it was a lot of federal dollars going in. Um, once again, using the, the, the federal purse current strings to to encourage a lot of the contractors that are that, that, that are up there. Uh, once again, a lot of influence came out of Washington for that to happen. And Congressman Allhan is being commended for what he did there. Um, when we look at, um, you know, uh, Hino, and I, I, I kind of, uh, I just want to point out, 
when we look at Hino and Oberush and, and all these jobs that were great, keep in mind those Democrats that, that, that have done that. And uh, we're, you know, we're very proud of, of, of the work we've done to get those companies to, to locate here. So, you know, de de Democrat policies do work in helping create jobs. But when we look at Southern, well, when we look also look at what's happening in, in Northern West Virginia, you know, the, the, the broadband expansion, once again, a lot of federal dollars went in place. You know, the highway system, federal dollars, once again, building that infrastructure. Water sewer that we need, federal dollars, once again, doing that. So the federal government has a tremendous, uh, is a tremendous player, and we have to understand that and remember that. That's why I get right back to the, when I was um, uh, chiding Congress on not, not passing a long-term transportation act. We need those types of things in place. When we look at southern West Virginia, you know, topography hurts us down there. It is rugged. The terrain is extremely rugged. But that does not mean that we cannot create the model that was created in northern West Virginia where we, where we doubled down and, and really put a lot of investment in high-tech jobs where we're laying fiber optics, where, where the topography does not necessarily harm us, where we can build buildings and create good jobs. Um, you know, but once again, a lot of that was the federal government stepping in and working with us. And I think when we look at what's happening in southern West Virginia, um, once again, you've got uh, Congressman Ray Paul down there, uh, a ranking member on transportation, and absolutely that's going to be key to southern West Virginia is completing the, the, the road system in southern West Virginia. Follow that up with putting in the, the water and the sewer infrastructure. But once again, it's going to take tremendous federal dollars to do that. Follow that up with the uh, with, with the broadband and the fiber optics that, that the Southern West Virginia needs in order to create the environment for those types of jobs to be created that we have uh, that, that, that's happened in Fairmont. Fairmont just got in, in nor Northern West Virginia just happened to get a 20 year job, um, and, and it's worked out very well for us. Let me uh, build a little bit off that uh, because there was an interesting way that. They, we fund uh, from the federal government. We send money to Charleston and, and Columbus and Harrisburg. We call it a state revolving fund. And typically it's about a billion and a half annually goes to each of those states for dispersion for sewer and water lines. This past year, the EPA cut that by almost 40%. They cut almost $600 billion, $600 million out of that account. So when she appeared before my committee, on energy and carbon. I asked her that question. Where did you go with that money? What are you doing? Her answer, they're using it for initiatives for climate change. They're pam pam pamphlets that they want to distribute. And I, I, I said to her, look, I go to, we, we hold all these town hall meetings with a lot of municipalities. And the, almost invariably, the first time someone, the hand we raise, someone will say, we need money to be able to do that. Can you get us a grant or, or low interest loan or something to do that? I've never had someone put up their hand and say, I'm a little low on climate change pamphlets. Can you send me a box? Yeah. Uh, that, but that $600 million went away to be able to take care of a town like Bud in West Virginia. That's in September of last year, hit, or you go over to in Philippi or go over to, uh, to Petersburg, West Virginia, and tie those little towns. The people are still having to get water by a water buffalo. That's wrong in today's society. But let me, let me touch on it because I love it, the whole thing economic about If we're going to rebuild this country, get people confident again with it, I think we have to show it works. And one of the things in West Virginia, there are two things that, that I'm particularly interested in, is continue to expand our exporting in West Virginia. Now, we've made some great strides, but we have a long way to go with that building. You just think about it, people that are in the mining industry right now. If, the, if they don't have the coal mines in West Virginia to supply that equipment to, what about around the world? Look what Fletcher's doing uh, over in Huntington. Fletcher now controls about 90% of the, of the underground mining in South America or South Africa with their equipment. Swanson Industries being able to provide pistons uh, all over the world that they do, particularly down the, in the South America. Allegheny Hardwood, those are the kinds of things that we can do. There's a little company in Wheeling uh, Chad Remp uh, with Wheeling Truck. They sell Volvo truck parts all over the world, exporting. That's where I think you could find wherever you are, you could find a way to export your product around. And so the next one, it's a, a bit of a sleeper, but we're trying to make some noise in Washington to get some more money into it, is agriculture. In West Virginia, we, we consume about $8 billion worth of food annually, but we only produce less than $500 million worth. 
So that's nothing but upside if we can get people to invest in our agriculture. And that might be that might work in some rough terrain areas of West Virginia. That might work in agriculture to be able to produce a product there, whether whatever that is. I'm, uh, my great grandfather was a was a, was a farmer. My grandfather was a coal miner. So. It, it's all hard work, and I think that's maybe how they're going to be able to take care of it. So just ways that I think with a little vision, we can pull this state back together again. Uh, and to build a, uh, build a little bit even further what you have, and it goes back to, and, and, and harken back to the Senator Burge words, you know, a lot of those things were earmarks. When Congress earmarked and directed dollars, that's exactly where those dollars went. They were not open for the EPA to pull those dollars and use those for other parts. But unfortunately, um, you know, we've gotten away from earmarks, right, wrong, or indifferent. We can debate whether earmarks were a good thing or a bad thing. But when, when Congress federally directs dollars, the EPA wouldn't have the opportunity to go in and pull those dollars and use them for other parts. So that was a, that was a history lesson that Senator Byrd kind of tried to pre-warn us of back in his day because he took that very seriously as, as chairman of appropriations. But it also goes back to the continuing resolutions and continuing resolutions on the, once again, when we do that and we give these block grants or these block funds to federal agencies to determine and dis to distribute through the grant process, that's why we're in much of the situation that we're in today. Okay. I think we really only have time for one more. We may actually be out of time, but let's do this real quick. There's not a good enough here. Um, you know, I see two gentlemen uh, that seem to know their stuff, uh, pro-business. Um, I'm, I'm not seeing stark contrast here. Uh, and so I guess I'll start with you, Mr. Uh, you know, nicely. Uh, you know, what makes you a, a better pick as a first district uh, representative than, than Mr. McKinley? And that's the same for you. Right. Well, you know, I think, it, you know, I have a, a, a long history of, of, of getting things done. You know, um, I can understand um, to some degree uh, when Senator Manson talks about being frustrated um, because I, I like to get things done. I like to get accomplishments done. And um, very much like a flip pool, when you get a hold of something, you've got to see it through. You've got to get that, you know, that, that uh, completed. And, you know, I, I really believe that, that I have a skill set not only being, you know, in, in, from the executive side of government for 22 years and, and working on the budgets, I believe I understand that. And I also believe I've got the ability to sit down and bring people from diverse uh, opinions together. And I think we need more folks in, in Washington that are willing to, to be that person in the middle and try to reach out to both sides and, and, and bring people into, you know, into an agreement. I think Senator Manchin is, is doing that in, in the Senate. Um, you know, I know he, I talked to him, I know he gets frustrated, but he's made a tremendous impact of using his common sense and being able to, to, to drive solutions towards the center. Um, I'm very much in that same vein, and, and, and I believe I can be very successful in doing that. Um, you know, um, as you said, David and I agree on a lot of issues, and I think we, you know, we both are, understand that, that it's the private sector that creates jobs in this country, not the government. But there are certain things that the government has to do in order to make sure that the private sector can create those jobs. But at the end of the day, it was about somebody that, that can be a consensus builder. And I've done that for 22 years very, very successfully. And I think that's one of the strongest suits that I bring um, to this race. And I think I can do that better than what Congressman McKinley has done in the last four years. Well, what we don't need in Washington is another career politician. We have plenty of those people over there right now. Uh, and for whatever reason they've chosen to make a career. I'm not. Uh, at this point in my career, I've had a wonderful career in the private sector. Next year, I will have been in the construction industry for 50 years in one way or another, starting in 1965 with picked up a lunch pail and went to work for the State Road Commission. We were building the interstate across the high county. So I'm starting to date myself because back then, the only way you could do it was old Route 40. But, Lunch box like that? Yeah, yeah, it is exactly like that. To go out there and work with them. That I've worked with my hands. I know what it, I know what we need to do to build, rebuild this country. And I take that those 50 years in the private sector, not not government work, uh, because that, that's a that's a whole different that, uh, a skill set to, to play in government. Uh, I want to make something happen, and I'm taking those that business experience back to Washington. And it has paid off. 23 of the bills that I've sponsored, co-sponsored, have been signed into law. 
So I don't know where people have this idea that nothing is being accomplished because it is. There are no, could we do better? Of course we could. But we gotta have some kind of agreement between that, between the House and the Senate. And one of the advantages we have right now, and I think we're gonna have it again, we're in the majority. And having a voice in the majority is much better than being in the minority in Washington. So I love speaking up for, it, for West Virginia in the majority, to be able to sit down with John Boehner or, or Kevin McCarthy, our leadership team, and talk about what we need to have in West Virginia and how we have to accomplish that to have to make that happen. Because they control all of the flow of legislation and how it's gonna happen with that. So having a voice in the majority, uh, I don't know how long we'll have that majority. You know, we've, we've seen that, that flip, but right now I don't think the House is going to flip. I do think the Senate may flip, and that's going to change the dynamics a lot, to being able to have someone, instead of just pigeonhole or putting a bill in a, in a drawer, at least with Mitch McConnell, uh, they'll have a hearing or have some discussion with us. So I think and starting next year, I think you're going to see a different dynamics. Not entirely all for, the sun's going to come up, but it's not everything's going to be rosy. But it'll be better than it is right now, because we've had some opposite of people over on the Senate side. And I think now we have a little bit more dialogue that I think we can make some progress with it. Because the people are counting on it. There are too many people in this country are still unemployed or underemployed. Too many people have lost their, their insurance, lost their doctors. This, this health care plan needs to be revised. It can't be the way it is. I can go on and on with that, but it just, those are where we differ from each other. I take private sector business background to someone who's been in politics all their career. Now, there's, there's some advantages perhaps for him for that, but not what we need for this country, not to go ahead. I think we need to have more businessmen, and it has to be more than two engineers and 48 businessmen in Congress. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a great session. Yeah. Thank Appreciate you very much. much. Thank you. Good luck for the next uh, three weeks. Next week. Really really then is it? Yeah. It's 21 days. 21 or something. days. Something like that. <laughs> 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 Take care. Thank you. We'll uh, turn this off.